first, I just want to apologize for all of you who came here to hear about fungi. I'm actually not going to talk about fungi today, and I'm also not going to talk uh, a great deal about um, genome evolution, although it plays indirectly into my talk, as you will hear. Instead, what I want to talk to you today is, is some new work that we're doing in terms of systems biology on tuberculosis. And even though I'm going to be talking to you about a human pathogen, I think that the techniques and the approaches that we're developing for this organism actually apply to all the organisms we've heard about. And indeed, we've, we've heard people talk about systems approaches so far in terms of biofuels and so forth. So, uh, but today, I'd like to talk to you about our work on TB. And just to get everybody up on to the same page, I think you're probably all familiar that um, TB is caused by a bacteria, mycobacterium tuberculosis, about 4,000 genes, so a pretty reasonably sized genome. And even though we don't really hear talk of TB um, so much these days, it's still a quite a significant problem. It causes two to three million deaths annually. Most of this is in the developing world. But more recently, we've seen the emergence of drug resistance. So 40, 40 years ago, we didn't even have a, a single drug to treat TB. And now we're seeing organisms that are not only resistant to multiple drugs, use my mouse instead here, so-called MDR-TB, but also very frighteningly this extreme drug resistance where we have TB strains that are, that are resistant to almost every drug that we have. And you've probably heard about this person's speaker who flew around the world with what was thought to be XDR-TB. Um, we're, we're quite interested in looking at drug resistance, although I'm not going to talk about that today. Now, part of the reason why TB is still so successful a pathogen has to do with an aspect of its pathogenesis that's at the heart of our research. And as most of you know, the primary route for catching TB is through inhalation. And after inhalation, um, TB are taken up by alveolar macrophages. And for most people, your immune system is competent to clear it. Most people will just clear TB and never know they have it. But for some people, healthy people, TB are able to persist inside of macrophages and go on to uh, form what's called latent TB, this sort of asymptomatic form of TB. And, and the scary statistic is that one third of the world is thought to have latent TB. Now, that's mostly in Africa, Russia, China, it's less so in this audience, but it's still a scary statistic. And um, it has a number of clinical implications. So first of all, the persistent bacteria, um, this state of persistence that the bacteria undertake is thought to underlie part of the reason and why it takes so long to treat TB. So it takes a cocktail of three to four drugs, six to nine months to treat TB. And you can imagine with a regimen that, that's, that is that complex, this leads to patient noncompliance. And patient noncompliance, of course, leads to drug resistance, which cycles back around to treatment length and complexity. And so there's, there's sort of a serious issue here in terms of trying to understand how we can clear this persistent bacteria. But latent TB also form a reservoir for reactivation TB. And the statistic here is that if you're healthy and have a, a reasonable immune system, there's a 5% chance chance in your lifetime that you'll reactivate and catch active TB if you've been exposed with latent TB. But if you're immunocompromised and you have AIDS, that goes up to 5% per year that you'll get reactivated TB. And of course, as many of you know, in Africa, co-infection with TB and AIDS is a serious problem. It's, it's rather the twin horsemen um, of the, uh, the epidemic that's occurring in Africa. So latency and persistence is really at the heart of, of much of TB research right now, and, and it's really incompletely understood. It's thought to reflect something of a dormant state, and, and this gives rise to drug tolerance that, that I've already sort of alluded to. And in terms of what happens under the hood, we know that there are metabolic alterations. We know that there's, for example, a shift to lipids as the carbon source, and, and there's an adaptation to hypoxia, granulomas, these places where the TB reside, in human lungs anyways, is thought to be hypoxic, and TB um, adapts to this hypoxia. And we know a little bit about the regulatory programs that underlies this shift in metabolism and this shift to the conditions in the granuloma. But really, 250 genes, this, this catalog is more or less what we've got. We don't know the full circuitry. So this brings us to our approach. And our approach is really we want to piece together the circuitry that underlies TB's pathogenesis and in particular its persistence and latency. And that really means I want to be able to develop a predictive model of both metabolism and regulation. And to do so, we're going to take everything that's at our disposal. We're going to apply all the genomic technology that's out there and all the genomic data and couple that with, um, with computational techniques to develop these predictive models. And now it turns out by way of background that the genomic foundation is actually quite good for TB. There's a tremendous amount of data that really, it's surprising when you look how much is out there. There's a lot of sequence data already. So of course, there are a number, um, say 30 or so now, of M tuberculosis strains. I really can't see that, so I'll use my mouse. 
um, strains here that have been the focus of most TB research. Um, these are all, of course, very close to one another, so the focus has really been on polymorphisms. But as we've heard from, from the B. subtle story and other um, examples of comparative analysis, we know that if we expand our view out to other organisms, there's a tremendous amount of power we can get by comparing out to further phylogenetically um, distant organisms. And so beneath the TB strains, there's this entire iceberg here that's underneath this tip of data that has been more or less underutilized with respect to DB that we've pulled together that's still close enough that we have since need um, uh, and also far enough that there's sufficient divergence to actually get some power. And there's also a tremendous amount of functional data. There's information on pathways, structures, uh, deletions, essentiality, and so forth. There's a lot of functional data already in place for TB. There's also a lot of expression data. It's remarkable how much expression data is out there. Something on the order of 600 arrays have been published. This broke our tools for using microarray data, by the way, on, on mammals. Um, and an additional 800 and plus microarrays were unpublished but useful sitting inside of the Stanford microarray database. So you had all this sequence data, you have all this expression data, and surprisingly it wasn't being utilized because nobody could get to it. So um, as sort of a side story here, in order to rectify this situation, the Gates Foundation funded a colleague of mine at Stanford, Gary Skolnick and myself, to develop a database where all this data could be made publicly available. This is TB database, it's an integrated database for all genomic data. And the point I want to make here is that this is a collaborative effort. We're actually, um, this is a collaborative effort between the Broad Institute and Stanford, um, with the PI, Gary Skolnick at Stanford University. And it's a collaborative effort that takes advantage of the strengths of both the Broad in terms of genomic sequence and the Stanford microarray database in terms of handling microarray data. And so what we've developed is really a federated system. And I think when we think about trying to develop databases to handle, say, all the fungi, so here I'm talking about fungi, um, one approach to doing this, because there's so much data out there, because different groups are approaching it in different ways, one possible scenario is to take a federated approach where people build together a system that, that sort of sits on top of the existing systems that are out there. And in terms of TB, this has been uh, quite successful. We've been able, through this approach, to release a wealth of data to the community. Um, 1,400 microarrays went out through TBDB, 320 streptomyces microarrays, a, ho uh, a, a list of host microarrays, as well as a wealth of genomic data that was previously um, underappreciated. And all this goes through a single site that looks like a single site, but is really federated under, under the hood, and therefore, as I said, takes advantage of the, um, of the capabilities of the, uh, of the two centers. And of course, because um, one of the centers that's participating is at the Broad, we're also um, able to take advantage of the Broad Microbial Sequencing Center and all the sequencing that's being done there to make available through TBDB all of the genomic sequencing we're doing for TB. And I'm not going to get into this uh, very much, but of course, we know that with the, uh, the current stream of sequencing technology, we're able to do a tremendous amount of sequencing. Sequencing. And this 70 plus TB genomes is actually a woeful underestimate at this point. There's, there's much more sequencing that we're doing that we will release um, through TBDB with the tools for being able to handle, in this case, most of this is Selexa data. So polymorphism, discovery, and Selexa data will make that all available. So that's kind of the foundation that we were building on. But of course, we, needed, we knew we needed to go further to do real systems biology. We needed to, do, um, to take a functional approach. We needed to collect the kinds of data that one could actually model, because this is really sequence and expression. And so in, in order to make this a reality, a group of us got together and formed a collaboration. Um, uh, uh, these, these include Gary Skolnick, who I've already mentioned who I work with, as well as David Sherman, Branch Moody, Chris, and Stefan Kaufman, all leaders in the TB field, to develop a consortium to do systems biology for TB in a real way. And this is actually a contract through NIID um, to develop systems biology for TB. And the, the first basic goal of this approach is essentially to do comprehensive profiling of TB to collect the data to model, and I mean comprehensive. So we're doing chip seek and transcriptomics, we're doing glycomics, proteomics, lipidomics, metabolomics, and we're doing all of this on TB growing in vitro, as well as TB growing in macrophage culture, kind of an in vitro system, not a perfect one, but it's there. And all of this data is being integrated and then modeled with, um, with computational techniques for regulation and metabolism. And the important point here is that all of this profiling is all being done on the exact same sample. So these culture cores, if you will, that, that we're forming around these two conditions are producing a batch of culture, and then aliquots are being sent to each one of the profiling cores that are profiling these data, and then that all gets fed into an integrated system and database to do this sort of modeling. So um, we, we think this is, this is uh, fairly exciting because um, it's going to generate a data set that's, that's comparable. And not only are we doing 
sampling. We're sampling over time. We want to actually really capture the system as it's evolving in a state that, that is important to pathogenesis. And in our case, it's really the response of TB to hypoxia. So we're in fact taking TB and growing it in, in a controlled oxygen tension system and sampling over time as TB adapts to hypoxia. And because we don't really know what the time constants of the system are. We don't know, for example, if there are fast responses to hypoxia that are important. We really just don't. It's, it's kind of a black hole. We're also doing some very rapid sampling early on in time to capture those, those initial dynamics and see if they're relevant. We're doing this uh, sampling in time in the in vitro culture system as well as the macrophage culture system and collecting all of this data and once again integrating it with computational methods. So that's the data set. Now the question is, how are we going to computationally integrate it? And that, that's a talk in and of itself, but I wanted to highlight in this talk an approach, one of the several approaches we're taking, and in particular, one of the approaches we're taking to try to couple uh, transcriptomics and metabolomics as well as some of these other omics here to think about how we're going to do <coughs> metabolic modeling. And the motivation for this, because now we're shifting to the computational part of it, the motivation is that we know that we can do a pretty good job from genome sequence of reconstructing metabolic networks. Pretty good. We can build maps like this, and they're, they're useful. They're very nice pictures that go into genome papers, but they're not necessarily operational, for example. And we also, as I've already pointed out, can collect a tremendous amount of expression data, in particular for TB. It's, it's remarkable. We're collecting more. Our question is, can we actually combine these two capabilities in order to algorithmically predict metabolism from expression. Right? And this is not a new idea, really. People have done this before. I mean, a typical experiment will be you take your expression data set, say growth on glucose, and you'll do something like clustering or GSEA, and you'll find a set of genes that are all upregulated, and you'll say, oh, wow, that's very interesting. And you get a scientist who comes on board and says, oh, yes, look, it's, it's clearly doing gluconeogenesis because it's, the bypass genes are on or something like that. If you're really advanced, you might also take this data, paint it onto a metabolic map, look at the genes that are upregulated, so forth, and you know, once again, you'll, you'll take a look and say, oh yes, this looks like this pathway is on. We want to take it one step further and ask, can we actually directly, from expression data, through a model, predict characteristics of metabolic flux? So that was our goal. And we think we, 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 we believe we have a way, we're fairly confident we have a way to do this. Um, and the, our method builds upon a technique that I think many of you are familiar with called flux balance analysis. Now, I don't have time to get into the nuts and bolts in a half hour talk of flux balance analysis, but suffice to say that the basic, of our, the basic idea of our method is that we're extending flux balance analysis, which is a method for modeling steady state metabolism, by using expression data to model the maximum flux through a reaction. Let me give you the concept sort of in pictures. You can think of this in terms of pipes. So let's imagine that we have a metabolic map, say, for the TCA cycle for E. coli here, for example. And we have expression for E. coli growing on glucose. And let's just take, as an example, this first gene here of the glyoxylate shunt, isocitrate lyase, which is required for growing on two carbon sources, but not on six carbon sources. Right. So when you're growing on glucose, it's known that the isocitrate lyase gene is not very well expressed. And we would conceptually, not mathematically, but conceptually model this as a very thin pipe around this reaction. So there's less possible flux. We're not saying that there is exactly this much flux. There's just less possible flux because so there's less enzyme around. And therefore, using the machinery of FBA, we'd like to predict that more flux would go around the cycle and less would go through the shunt. Conversely, when you're growing on acetate, a C2 source, isocitrate lies is 21-fold upregulated. It's one of the most upregulated genes when growing on acetate. And we would conceptually model that as a very big pipe. So now there's more possible flux, not necessarily that there is more flux, but there's more possible flux through the shunt. And we would like to use FBA, or we'd like FBA with this modification to predict that therefore there'd be more flux through the shunt and less around the cycle. And perhaps if we were modeling glycolysis gluconeogenesis, there'd be more up the gluconeogenic shunt or the, uh, the pathway. And indeed, we're able to build sort of a toy model that gets us these predictions. Now this is a toy model. This is like two or three degrees of freedom. This is not really rocket science, really not even biochemistry science, just sort of a simple model. Um, but now, based on this sort of ability to do this, we wanted to take this to a real system, bringing it back to TB. 
And the system we were interested in is what's called mycolic acid biosynthesis. And for those of you who don't know, mycolic acids are a major cell wall constituent of, of TB as well as related species. And they're involved, they're kind of important because they're involved in antibiotic permeability as well as reactions and protection from stress within the macrophage environment. And importantly, they're a target of several first-line TB drugs. Uh, conveniently, there was, always, there was also a published FBA model that we could develop on and use as our substrate for modeling. The expression data we wanted to interpret with our method is a very famous Boshoff TB expression compendium. This is a, a compendium of 43, 436 different experiments that were all done by the same person in the same lab, which is really remarkable. Elena Boshoff, and I have to, my hats off to her for doing this. It includes, it's a, it's a two color array that includes 75 different drugs, drug combinations, and growth conditions. And our basic question is, can we predict the impact of each drug and or condition on mycolic acid biosynthetic capability. And the basic experimental approach is that we're going to take each experiment in the Bosch offset and we're going to take the two different channels, the control and the experiment channel, and we're going to treat them separately though not independently. First, we're going to pass the control channel through our model, setting the pipe widths according to the expression data in this control channel. And then we're going to predict how much mycolic acid flux is possible if we try to optimize mycolic acid production. Right? And we'll show that as, say, this green bar right here. We'll do the same thing for the drug condition, set the pipes according to the expression in the drug channel, make the same sort of prediction, compare the two in terms of the control on the drug. And in this case, we would say that this drug has caused a decrease in the capacity for mycolic acid production for TB, according to the expression state that this drug has induced. And we would show that as a downward deflection. Now, of course, we have to have statistics that show whether or not this is a significant deflection. We have that. We can go through and, for example, sample multiple different control conditions and ask how often would you expect to see this decrease if we just sort of looked at the variation that was in the control channel. We've done that. We can also look at specificity. Is this effect specific to the genes of the mycolic acid pathway as opposed to other pathways? I won't have time to get into that, but, but, but suffice to say we have that. But if we take that approach now, this basic method, and apply it to all 436 experiments in the Boshoff data set, this is a summary of the most pertinent results. And the first sort of most important point here is that there are seven known inhibitors in the Boshoff data set, and we correctly predicted six of them. And not only did we correctly predict six of them, we predicted both their strength and their specificity, whether or not they were specific to mycolic acid or non-specific had other effects. For example, PA824 here, a newer drug, has impact on mycolic acid as well as on protein synthesis, and we correctly predicted there was sort of an off-axis effect here. We also predicted a number of other weaker inhibitors, as well as, kind of excitingly, a number of enhancers. There are no known enhancers for mycolic acid production in TB. And we predicted a number, including one that was fairly exciting here, uh, although you know, it's still to be tested here, a drug called Menadion, with it, which at least in mammalian fat cells is known to upregulate fatty acid biosynthesis, which is the precursor for mycolic acid. So this is being tested, but the point is that uh, this looks fairly good. We, six out of seven uh, seem pretty decent. One question you might ask, of course, is, okay, fine, you're getting six out of seven. Is all of this work, all of this machinery to do metabolic modeling necessary? What if we just went back to the tried and true and took expression data, clustered it, and asked, would we see this effect? Could we make these predictions otherwise? And there are a couple of answers to this that, that kind of highlight some of the power of being able to do this. The first is, if you just take that, and we did, we took the expression data and clustered these data, and these are all the genes involved in fatty acid biosynthesis, the drugs that are known to inhibit mycolic acid are, are scattered throughout this tree. There are many different routes to inhibiting mycolic acid biosynthesis, and our metabolic model, we believe, integrates those different routes. So, of course, if you're smart, you could build a classifier that could manage to do this. You could get all the green arrows here clustered into one little part of the tree. That, that's, not, that's, that's not too terribly difficult. But the other rather important thing, sort of the second answer to the question, is that our method didn't require a labeled training set. If you want to do classification, you have to have a set of data where you have positive positive samples and negative samples, you say, ah, okay, this sample is closer to my positive sample. We didn't need that. In fact, we didn't even look at the drug labels until we were all done. We hadn't heard of some of these drugs until we were all done with this. We could have done this on the very first expression data set that came off the pipeline. We wouldn't have known if we were right until we did some validation, of course, but, but it could be done without a training set. The third answer to the question is that because we're modeling the system, we're not building a classifier, we can ask questions that weren't obvious to us when we built the system. So, for example, what I've sort of shown you up until now is if I have an um, expression data set from a known environmental condition, can I predict the metabolic state? We can turn that on its head 
with our system and say, if we had an unknown environmental condition or an unknown external condition, but we had expression data from that, could we predict the unknown environmental condition, kind of inverse the problem, if you will, because we have a model. We can ask, we can, we can tweak the model to do that. And so one example of this is if we have an unknown nutrient source out in the environment, and we, and we have expression data for the bug growing in that nutrient source, can we predict the nutrient source the bug is seeing? For example, um, and the idea here is that we expect that organisms adjust their metabolic state to the available nutrients. And expression data gives us a readout on that metabolic state. Therefore, through our system, we might ask, can we rank nutrients by how well they match a particular metabolic state? How optimal is a particular metabolic state based on this expression readout to a particular nutrient? I wish I could get you into the mechanics of it because it's pretty cool how this is done. This was work done by Desmond Lund. It's a really neat insight into how FBA works. But let me just um, say that it turns out we can. We can do this. So here I'm just showing you data if we want to take two different nutrient sources, X or Y, sort of a binary choice, and can we actually make the prediction. And what I'm showing here is each one of these cubes represents the simulation of the model um, growing with expression data, with glucose expression data here, a simulation of the model with this much, um, sorry, the, the labels have gone away. Let's say this much acetate, uh, uh, no, this much acetate and this much glucose. Glucose is on the y-axis. And the red here indicates that this nutrient combination is suboptimal, and the blue indicates that this nutrient combination is, is more optimal. And in this case, the left plot here represents when we've applied glucose expression, and the right plot is when we've applied acetate expression. So because the y-axis here is acetate, we've predicted that glucose is really not, or, or lots of acetate is not the likely nutrient source when we're growing with glucose expression. Anything over to the right. Whereas, if we're growing with acetate expression, we do actually predict that acetate is likely to be the source. This is a binary choice. We can expand this now out to, gosh, I forget how many we've done here. I mean, there's only six uh, cases where we can actually do this in E. coli, but we can throw in uh, 19 different um, um, distractors, if you will, a menu of 19 choices. And in this case, we don't always get the top choice, but the correct nutrient is always within the top five and often within the top two or three. And in some cases, when it's in the top two, it's just that our model doesn't differentiate between glucose, say, and gluconate. We, we aren't able to do that. So the method allows us to do multiple different things because we're getting the system. And you might ask, well, what's the relevance of this for TB? Well, in the case of TB, and this has application of algorithms, but in the case of TB, we're, of course, very interested in the environment within the macrophage within which TB grows. We actually don't know the nutrients that TB is using inside the macrophage. We know it's a lipid, but we don't necessarily know if it's short chain, long chain, branched, cholesterol, et cetera. Um, and we'd like to use in vivo TB expression data to try to sort of tease that out with our method. And that in vivo expression data is being collected by our, our collaborator, Gary Skolnick, as we speak, and through our systems biology uh, systems, our, our, our project. So, so that's actually coming, that data is coming. And this was part of the reason for doing this. But of course, one can imagine other, other um, uh, applications of this, uh, organisms that are growing, uh, that we can't culture, but, are, but require particular nutrients in the environment, can we predict what that might be and try to recreate um, the, the environmental conditions necessary for culture, for example. So we're, we're pretty excited about this, and we're actually expanding this now to a genome scale model. We've actually replicated all the results that I've talked about on TB on this genome scale model, which is a model that we've, uh, that we've built from McFadden, as well as uh, the Raman model I've talked about and some of the work done by Paulson. And, and we're sort of scaling this up now to see whether or not we can take advantage uh, of the TB data. I want to just give you sort of, as, as I conclude the talk, make the point that metabolism is a big part of what we want to do, but as I said, we're also very interested in getting the regulatory network worked out, the other major component of the metabol of the, of the molecular system of TB that we'd like to nail. And for that, just to kind of give you, this is ongoing work, but to give you sort of our approach, we're combining the ChIP-seq and the transcriptomics I've talked about, but we're also taking advantage of the comparative genomics. And of course, I, I think this approach is going to be fairly um, uh, familiar to most of you. Uh, you're all familiar with, of course, ChIP-seq, uh, I believe, in terms of, of its approach, what we're looking for in terms of chip ChIP-seq, without getting into the details, is, is an enrichment of reads that we're taking from the ChIP-seq sample around the target site. I just want to show you that, in fact, ChIP-seq works. So as a method for identifying where transcription factor binds for TB, it's remarkable. We know this works well on human, but TB, where you're talking about four megabases, it's, it's an amazingly uh, useful technique. So here I'm just showing two different intergenic regions. These blue arrows are genes. 
And the red peaks here are the enrichment peaks coming out of ChIP-seq. And where we see an uptick is where we're predicting a transcription factor binds. In this case, it's a transcription factor called DOS-R which is responsible for the early responses to hypoxia. And here we're showing two places where um, ChIP-seq predicts that DOSR binds. You can see it's just an amazing peak. ChIP-seq is in some cases, to a first approximation, rendering the, the question of where does a transcription factor bind to just staring at plots like this and looking at where the peaks are, are landing, right? It's very, of course, there's statistics around that we're developing, but the point is it just stands out like a sore thumb. And these are two um, genes, just examples that we know are bound by, by DOSR. But ChIP-seq, though it's great, is just part of the, of the foundation. Of course, we recognize that ChIP-seq only tells us where a transcription factor binds. It doesn't necessarily tell us what the transcription factor is doing when it binds there. And that's why we bring in the transcriptomics. The transcriptomics, we believe, will help us both um, pull out additional connections in the regulatory network, but also for the connections we've got from ChIP-seq, give us some sense of, is this transcription factor upregulating, downregulating? Is there a particular regulatory program that we can tease out of the transcription data, especially as the volume of it grows? And then finally, because it wouldn't do to not uh, talk about uh, uh, comparative genomics, we are leveraging all that TB data that I mentioned uh, very, at the very front of my talk to be able to help with this as well. And we're all familiar with the power of doing phylogenetic footprinting. It happens to work in TB as well, not surprisingly. Here I'm showing you uh, a region upstream of one particular gene called the YB1 gene. Each line here is one strain in our data set. And red text on black is 100% conserved, and black on white is less conserved. And so blocks like this, where we see these big blocks of black, are places where we see conservation against the sea of lack of conservation. And it's remarkable how these things sort of pop out. It turns out this is a region where we knew something about what was happening to this promoter, which is why I'm showing as an example. And we know, for example, this is a CRP binding site. This is the ribosome binding site. Here's a transcription start. And here, here is a negative 35, negative 10 transcription uh, start sites. But we also see this other conservation here that actually is the same conservation. You can't really read it off, but this looks like it's very similar um, sequence. And we're able to make the prediction by taking advantage of phylogenetic footprinting and all the uh, functional data we've got that these may actually represent faux P and faux R sites in this promoter region. And you might ask, well, what is faux P and faux R? What are they doing binding to the transcription start site? Wouldn't that actually inhibit um, regulation of this gene? And sure enough, when we go back to the expression data, that's exactly what we see. Faux R and faux P are counter um, regulatory to, uh, to this YB1 gene. So um, all of this, of course, is being put together into uh, a predictive regulatory network. And this is just, this was here more for, for the TB crowd that we're able to do this for DOS R, but we're doing this genome-wide. Um, and then ultimately, of course, we'd like to pull this all together. Our goal is to take the metabolic network that we're developing and the regulatory network that we're developing and couple them, allowing us to start to make some real predictions about the biology, really predictive um, uh, modeling. And so, for example, we can try to predict what happens if we upregulate or downregulate certain genes in the regulatory model that we think might be important for pathogenesis, what happens in terms of other genes in the network as well as metabolic changes and get some insight into pathogenesis. Um, we can look for small metabolites that are being excreted by our metabolic model as potential um, um, diagnostics, small molecular diagnostics that we can use for thinking about um, developing that for TB. Um, and then of course we can do the classic thing which people have been doing uh, with FBA as well as regulatory networks for a long time. We can knock genes out and ask, uh, can we identify new drug targets? One obviously very interesting target for us is can we identify identify a compound that would knock TB out of its persistent state into an active state because we have drugs that work well but if we could have a cocktail that would allow us to sort of resuscitate TB so those active drugs would work, that would be a, an attractive cocktail indeed. Um, and then finally, even if you don't like our computational approach, and everybody has their own opinions on these matters, um, all of this data will be available to everybody through TBDB. That is a part of our contract. All the genomic data is already there, and more of it's coming. But all of this, this, uh, this functional data is going to be made available through an offshoot of TB database, a special database that sort of sits on top of that for the systems biology um, um, project. So. That's really all I had to say in the time I've got, but I do want to acknowledge the many, many people that uh, we work with to make this happen. The various people involved in TB database at both the Broad and Stanford, in particular Robert Riley, who's the, the, um, the, the curator at the Broad, as well as Peter Christian, the rest of these uh, engineers who built the system. Gary Skolnick, who's the PI at Stanford, a wonderful PI and a great colleague. Also um, a PI with me on the systems biology grant and, and all the folks doing that systems biology work. It really is amazing collaboration, a wonderful group of people. And then in terms of metabolic modeling, Caroline Kaline, Desmond, and Aaron did most of, and Jeremy did most of the work that I presented. And in terms of comparative analysis and regulation, I really have to thank David Sherman, who did the chip um, 
for the ChIP-seq that I presented, uh, as well as Desmond and Matt for analyzing the data. And with that, I'll take any questions. Yes. I guess I can just shout. Uh, sure. Firstly, I want to, uh, this is pretty cool stuff. Uh, are you aware of the, the TDR drugs database that has just been funded by the WHO? Uh, you know, I, we're aware of several databases. One of the things I didn't have uh, time to show was a slide where we talk about all the partner databases that we're working with. CD, I'm not as familiar with the database that you've mentioned, although I'm sure I've heard of it. So this is, yeah. this is a very new project just okay. by the WHO, and it sure. actually came from the lab I was in at the ah. University of Pennsylvania. David Bruce is one of the PIs on it. Oh, yes, yes, I've heard uh, of that, yes. Yes, yes so of course, actually, yes. The yeah. good thing about that is that they actually have information from uh, pharmaceutical company yes. so that is now given out free to researchers to see right. what drugs affect what conditions. So right, right. Uh, the question I have for you is that this is, I do a lot of data integration too, but this seems to be very ambitious, where mm -hmm. you're actually going across all these scales. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. So how are you going to integrate all these different kinds of data? I mean, you've shown metabolomics and, yes. you know, uh, flux balance and so on. That's right. But proteomics? Well, so proteomics is actually the easiest way to answer that question. Proteomics, so if you think about our method for integrating expression with metabolic data, we're taking mRNA as a proxy for the amount of enzyme that's right. there. It, so proteomics is actually something we're really eager to get our hands on because we want to get that proteomic data and use that directly to constrain our model and make predictions and see if we can't uh, potentially infer any translational control or inactivation feedback, that sort of thing in right. our model. Do you know how quantitative proteomics is sort of difficult? It, absolutely. There, there are going to be challenges here, but... Uh, I think they're exciting challenges. Um, yeah, it is ambitious. I mean, one thing I forgot to mention that that, as I said, even if you disagree with the, the approach, with the uh, with the computational work, with the data we're going to get for the amount of resource we have, we're going to be able to chip seek 130 of the 180 transcription factors in TB in several different conditions. So regardless of our methods, all that data will be there. We'll hit most of the regulatory network with the data, and then we're building computation on top of that. So it's ambitious, but the data are are up to the task. And that's really the most important thing. Uh, yes, yeah, you, you touched on this a little bit in your desire to have proteomics, but I was wondering yeah. if you thought any of your FBA plus expression misses were informative. <laughs> Yes, yes, we, we think they are, and we're still, we're still diving into that. One of the FBA misses that we thought was particularly intriguing is that I said we got six of seven inhibitors. The seventh one we predicted as an enhancer. I don't know what that means. We're diving into that. It, 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 there are two possibilities. The most likely one is it's just a false prediction, although it's encouraging that we did pick it up as a modulator. The kind of pie-in-the-sky cool thing is that we have seen there's suggestions that one way of adapting to triclosan and resisting it is to upregulate, is to uh, is to develop a mutation that upregulates fatty acid biosynthesis in the face of triclosan. We don't see any evidence of that yet in TB, but we're doing the sequencing, so it's, it's a possibility. Yeah.